Good morning. This video is going to introduce us to the course and the topic that we're going to be studying. So uh, the topic goes by a lot of different names. Uh, some people call it statistical learning, other people call it machine learning. Um, another term that's been around for a long time is data mining, which um, more or less means the same thing. So what what is this topic? Well, uh, before we get into the kind of details of it, um, I, I want to point out that the, that the term is usually defined uh, as being some sort of process. And so one of my favorite versions of this process is the cross-industry standard for data mining. I'd encourage you to spend some time um, uh, on this Wikipedia page uh, to, to, to understand the, uh, the scope of data mining. Um, but this is the way they characterize this process. So, so what data mining is going to do is use data and models to make better business decisions and, and, and um, uh, execute things better in, in, in some context. All right, so the point that I'm trying to make here is it's, it's, it's about solving some practical problem in a domain. And so the absolute first step in this process is to understand that domain. You know, you, you can't solve a problem in a domain unless you understand what are the constraints, um, what, what things are, just aren't practical in this, in, in this uh, domain. Um, what are the levers that I have? So what, what things can I change? Um, what am I trying to achieve? What is my goal? Um, and so all of that comes down to this uh, business understanding. Now, what's happening is that uh, across industries, whether whether it's um, you know astronomy or gen genetics or um, uh, you know retailing, uh, all of these um, uh, domains now live in data-rich environments where it becomes much easier to collect uh, and analyze large data sets. So this process puts data. In the middle, okay. So, so there, there, there's a database out there, and, and they've been collecting stuff. Um, this stuff, um, it, you know, wasn't gathered for a particular task often, um, but where we want to use it to make our business work better. So that's that's the basic problem. All right. So we have data in the middle, but we have to understand the business now. What usually happens as, um, as, as a data miner is, um, you know, you, you jump in and you need to first understand what's in this data. Um, so what can you trust? What can you not trust? Uh, I'll just give you a quick example. One of my favorite examples, uh, I had a group of students working for an insurance company uh, so doing a project. And this insurance company had a safe driver app. And so the, um, the app uh, tracked your, your, your uh, driving behaviors, and if you uh, were deemed a safe driver, you got a better you know, insurance rate. Now, one of the things they noticed when they started looking at the data was that there were people who would accelerate very quickly to say, you know, 200 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour, and then they would just vanish. So then the question is, why? Why? Why would they vanish? And what we finally realized after we put it on a map is that these were people who were on airplanes who had not turned off their safe driver app. And so um, if you're going to be using that to, to evaluate a person's driving skills, you don't want to have data in there uh, when they're sitting on an airplane taking off uh, on a runway. All right. So what, what's really important is to understand um, you know, what, what's in that data and make sure that um, you don't have uh, data that shouldn't be in there. Um, what else is included in data understanding? Well, things like, um, you know, uh, uh, what, what are your primary keys? How do the tables go together? Um, all of those things that you um, would cover in a relational database class to make sure that the data you have is okay. Now, we're not going to do a lot with those two boxes in this class. Uh, I'm going to be giving you a couple projects where you'll get some data and you'll have to, um, you know, figure out these things. But I, I'm not going to be teaching it. This isn't a class on relational databases. 
it's not really a class on uh, you know a business, if you will. This is a class on data mining. Um, so where we're going to um, spend our time are in really in the next two or three boxes. So we have to prepare data. I have a, a, a lecture coming up on feature engineering. So what is this about? This is about taking uh, tables in a relational database and converting them into data that you can actually use to build models. Now, um, the step after that is building models. And our textbook was written by um, you know, by very famous modelers who um, uh, spend most of the, you know, their, their time in this book describing the different machine learning models. And so we're going to spend probably 90% of our time in this box on modeling. Once you build a model, you have to figure out how to evaluate it. We're going to have um, a, a, a week on how you evaluate different models. We're not going to do anything with deployment in this class, but ultimately you have to take your results and put them into um, operational systems. All right, so that's that's in, in, a, in, a, in a couple minutes what data mining covers. So let's go back to the course packet. I now want to um, uh, kind of get into what all the models in this class are going to do. And I, I, I was, this has been a kind of a hard lecture for me. I've been avoiding making it, to be honest with you. Um, so how do, how do you introduce um, this, this whole topic? I, um, I, I think back to the first article that I read on machine learning. And I, unfortunately, I don't have the article anymore. But the, um, the article used an example that really stuck with me. And so since it stuck with me for so long, I thought I would give it to you as well. Um, the article talks about a fairy tale. Um, so there's a fairy tale in, um, in, in English called Little Red Riding Hood. And, um, you know, if, 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 you, um, if you're not familiar with it, let me give you a, the one-minute version. Uh, basically, there's a big bad wolf who um, uh, wants to eat Little Red Riding Hood, who's a little uh, girl. And uh, so the little girl, Red, Little Red Riding Hood, is going to go visit her grandmother and um, so the big bad, bad wolf uh, goes to the grandmother's house and, um, you know, in different, different versions tell it in different ways, but um, eats the grandmother. And then the big bad wolf dresses up as a grandmother and goes into the grandmother's bed and waits for Little Red Riding Hood so that when Little Red Riding Hood gets there, the wolf can just jump out of bed and eat her up. And so Little Red Riding Hood shows up. Uh, and, um, you know, recognizes this, this doesn't quite look like my grandmother. So um, I pulled a couple pictures. This is a very famous um, uh, fairy tale. And so here's, here's some pictures that you can see where you got the wolf dressed up as a grandmother. And so Little, little Red Riding Hood comes in and notices, you know, this, this isn't your typical grandmother. And so what's, um, what's uh, unusual about this? Well, one of the things that she notices is that this particular grandmother has pointy teeth, whereas her other grandmother doesn't have pointy teeth. Um, another feature that uh, Little Red Riding Hood picks up on is the presence of pointy ears. So these ears are very pointy. Grandmothers usually don't have pointy ears. All right, so you know, that's, that's the fairy tale. And Little Red Riding Hood has to recognize that this is not a grandmother, and therefore she should run for her life. Um, as opposed to, um, you know, going up and giving grandma a hug or something. All right. So let's say that we wanted to build a machine learning wolf detector to help Little Red Riding Hood out in recognizing the difference between a wolf and a grandmother. How would we do that? How would we do that? So I'm going to take us back to the course packet. There are two types of machine learning approaches. In, um, that would be covering this book, supervised and unsupervised learning. So let's, um, let's talk about the supervised approach. With the supervised approach, actually with, with either of these approaches, we would go off and gather a large, what's called a training set. We need to train our algorithm to recognize a wolf versus a grandmother. So I would go gather 
a whole lot of cases, like I've just gathered a training sample right here of cases. You know, not all of these um, uh, wolves look exactly the same, um, and that's good. That's good. I've got a whole sample of, um, of, of wolves. Uh, what I'd also need in this training set would be a picture of a, a set of pictures of grandmothers. So you have to be able to have both grandmothers and wolves to train the algorithm to recognize um, the difference between them. All right, so um, I need a training set, and we're going to call that training set a bunch of x factors. So um, I'm going to go over to a scratch pad and, um, and, 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 and draw out what this is going to look like. So our training set is going to consist of a, um, of a matrix uh, X. Throughout the course, this is going to be an N by P matrix. So we have N uh, training cases. So in this case of Little Red Riding Hood, uh, we're going to have N images. All right, and so this, we're going to always represent it something like this. X11, X21, all the way through Xn1. Okay, so this is going to be measurements on each of my images. And so this could be something like big teeth. Right, does the image have big teeth or not? Um, and then we're going to have uh, X1P. So we're going to have P different um, you know, attributes that I've measured on each of my images. So this could be, for example, pointy ear. P-O-I-N-T, pointy ear. Pointy ears. This is going to run all the way through XNP. And that is my, uh, my set of, of training cases. Now, in the case of supervised learning, so remember I said there are two types of um, machine learning models, of supervised and unsupervised learning models. Um, we're going to have some way of classifying each of these training cases into either wolves or grandmothers. Okay, so that um, you know the output vector, these are these are called these are called inputs. So the input, you know, picture a, a camera that I have and this camera looks uh, at the image and detects if it has big teeth and has pointy ears, if it has big eyes and all the other things that Little Red Riding Hood looks for. Those are inputs. My output is going to be an n by 1 vector um, uh, called y. And this is going to have the correct answer. So I need to have some human expert, probably, in this case, uh, go through these images and classify them as, you know, 1 is a big bad wolf, 0 is a, uh, is a grandmother. So we'll just call that y1, y2, all the way through yn, where y sub i is equal to 1 if it's a wolf, 2 if it's a grandmother. All right, so what is, uh, what is supervised learning all about? Well, what we need to do is to build a function f. So we're seeking a function f that takes one of these rows as an input. Okay, so one of these rows is an x. And so uh, some f at x is going to be, uh, you know, my machine learning model processing these x's and telling me whether or not this is a, a grandmother or a wolf. So whether or not that's a grandmother or wolf is this function of x plus some noise. All right, that's what we're trying to do. So let's go back to the, um, the uh, uh, course packet. Uh, as, as I mentioned before, these y's are outputs, the x's are inputs. The um, e's are errors or noise. We call that you know, an error or a noise. And what we're trying to do with all of these machine learning models, you probably heard the uh, expression separate the signal from the noise. This f is the signal, e is the noise. Now, there are two types of problems in um, uh, supervised learning. There are regression problems and there are classification problems. What's the difference? So a regression problem is where the thing we're trying to predict is a numerical variable, whereas um, 
the classification problem is where y is categorical. So in the case of my wolf detector, um, we have a categorical dependent variable, and this would be a classification problem. So really what we're going to be doing is something like this. Uh, this could be big teeth. So that could be my x1. And this is pointy ears. And so with each of these pictures, I'm going to have training cases. And so maybe I have a bunch of people down here. These are a bunch of images with uh, small ears and small teeth. The ears are not pointy. They're nice and round like a good grandmother's ears should be. And then I have some uh, cases out here where I've got very pointy ears and big teeth. And um, what I need to be able to do is come up with uh, a separating hyperplane, in this case it's just a line, that's going to tell you um, these are all wolves, these are wolves, these are grandmothers. We'll just put grandmother for grand for, grand for grandmother there. All right, so that, that's, um, that's a classification problem because my y has two possible uh, values. Another very famous example of a classification problem is uh, handwriting recognition. So uh, the post office released a data set called the MNIST data where they have images of digits. So maybe you have um, a box here that's been pixeled and you have to recognize this as a four and not something else. All right, so that would also be a classification problem because there's 10 possible um, things that I'm trying to recognize. So a zero, a one, through a nine. Each one of those would be different classes. Let me give you an example of a regression problem. So a regression problem could be something like this. I have one X, so let's say I have P equal one predictor, which is the amount I spend on advertising at my firm. Then this is my sales. And so maybe I observe a scatter plot that looks something like this. So as I, as I uh, spend more on advertising, my sales tends to go up. So what I seek is some sort of a machine learning model that would, um, that would describe the relationship between sales and advertising. So this line right here is my F. So this is my f at x, where x is advertising, all right? Now, the relationship is not perfect, so some, there's other stuff that happens. Maybe I sell more due to the weather, or I sell more because of something else, and, or maybe in another period I sell less. Um, these deviations between my f and the observed value are these errors, okay? so. Uh, that, that's the noise. So the signal is the line, um, the noise are the deviations from the line. So those are two types of machine learning, supervised learning problems. So either it's regression or it's classification. Now there's another distinction that we want to make. So uh, there are two types of, uh, another way, another two types of supervised learning models. There are parametric models, which we're gonna be covering in chapters three and four, and then there are gonna be non-parametric models that we'll be covering in, in uh, chapters nine, uh, seven through nine. So what is the difference between a parametric model and a non-parametric model? So with parametric models, we are going to specify some specific functional form that is, um, involves a certain number of parameters, you know, some, un, some set of unknown parameters. And often, these parameters are going to be of great interest to us. So we're going to actually want to interpret these parameters. So as an example, this is a parametric functional form. So um, actually, there should be an X after that beta 1. I'll fix that before I release this to you. So let's just go back to my picture over here. Let's say that I said sales 
is equal to uh, some intercept, okay, so this is my intercept right here, plus beta 1 times advertising. So uh, this would be an example of a parametric uh, model to represent the relationship between sales and advertising. Now I said that often we're very interested in interpreting these parameters. So let's just think about the meaning of beta 1. What does beta 1 tell us? Well, beta 1 uh, is the slope. Okay, so for a, a one unit increase in my advertising, um, I get beta 1 additional sales on the average. Okay, so that's just telling me for an additional unit of advertising, what do I get in return for that? And of course, that, uh, you know, that, that, that parameter has an important meaning to me if I'm a decision maker. You know, I, I wouldn't want to, if, if a unit of advertising costs me $100 and I only get $10 back, I don't want to buy any more advertising. On the other hand, if a unit of advertising costs me 10 and I get $100 in sales, then that's a really smart thing to do. Okay, so that's an example of what's called a parametric model because I have a very you know, specific functional form that involves a couple unknown parameters, and these parameters are of great interest to me. Now, the other type of machine learning, supervised learning model, is non-parametric. So non-parametric models don't involve uh, you know, a simple uh, you know, function like this. Uh, what, 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 they, what they involve is some very flexible family of functions, uh, and we don't, we're, we're usually not that interested in the parameters. So just as a quick example of this, let's go back to advertising and sales. We're going to start with a new picture, so um, uh, it's kind of clean here. And maybe I have some points like this. All right, and let's just say I wanted to estimate my sales for this level of advertising. So we could call this X naught for some particular level of advertising. So how much do you think I'm going to sell? Well, one non-parametric approach to this is called a nearest neighbor approach. So nearest neighbor approaches say this, um, average the K nearest neighbors around that point. Okay, so if I had the zero nearest neighbor, uh, I'm going to take zero neighbors around this, and, it, and my estimate would just be this point. And uh, if, if I did this for each of my points, my function would look like this. Okay, and, and hopefully you don't like that function. You would say it's way too uh, wiggly. You know, it, it follows every wiggle in the data, and the reason for that is I failed to separate the signal from the noise. I am following every bit of noise here with that function. Well, I'm gonna go get a red pen now, and let's do the one nearest neighbor. So the one nearest neighbor smoother would be to average these three points. So if I average these three points, what is this value averaged with this value averaged with this value? Well, I think it's about here. And if I did that for each of my points, I would have something that kind of passed through the middle of the data, and it gives me a nice smooth curve, hopefully, um, this would be a much better representation of this, um, uh, you know, here I've clearly separated the signal, which is, you know, as I advertise more, sales go up, but maybe it flattens out a little bit. And then I've separated that from the noise, all these uh, stochastic variations from that nice smooth curve. So this is your F, and then these deviations would be your errors. Now there's a problem if I take too many points. Let's take the uh, 10 nearest neighbor smoother. So I'll do that in orange. The 10 nearest neighbor points would be average all the values of everything, which I think would be here. Average the 10 nearest neighbors here, and you're going to end up with a um, uh, just a line. And here I've kind of I've, I've over smoothed. So this is the, um, you know, the 10 nearest neighbor smoother. And I've over smoothed and uh, I've lost the signal in that case. 
So the point I want to make with all this is that um, these non-parametric methods usually uh, involve some sort of a smoothing parameter that controls the flexibility. So they're, they're very flexible, they adapt to the data, um, but you have to control the flexibility. You've got to choose the right amount of smoothing. And um, that's going to be a big part of this class. Chapters 5 and 6 are going to be um, how do we control this, um, this amount of flexibility and choose the right value. And so um, that'll be in, in our course as well. All right, so that's, um, that's supervised learning. What about unsupervised learning? Well, unsupervised learning is where we don't have a, um, a set of labels. You know, so go back to Little Red Riding Hood where we had a, an expert classify those pictures as uh, grandmothers or wolves. Uh, so here we're just looking for interesting patterns in the X's. There's going to be two types of unsupervised learning models as well. One's called the clustering problem. The other one's called the dimensionality reduction problem. So with clustering, we're trying to find categorical types. So let's just go back to my um, picture here. And if you look at this scatter plot, um, what I see without any you know, labels is I've got a big cluster of points, a big clump of points out here that are similar to each other. Um, and then I've got another uh, clump of points out here that are similar to each other. And so without you, any uh, training cases, without any tra uh, you know, training labels, pardon me, the labels being the Ys, I see I have two clusters. So we could just call this cluster one and cluster two. And uh, then I could go off and examine these cases and determine, aha, I've uh, you know, successfully grouped all my grandmothers together and all my wolves together. So that would be an example of clustering. Um, what's dimensionality uh, reduction about? So the basic idea with dimensionality reduction is we're going to seek out a lower dimensional representation to my data. So maybe I've got p equal to 2 x's. So this is my x1 axis, this is my x2 axis. And if I were to plot these, maybe I get something like this. So th these are all the points. These are all my training cases. And what, um, what I've tried to rig this um, is to, to show that they, they mostly fall in a lower dimensional subspace. That's very fancy language for they fall in a line. Okay, so with dimensionality reduction, what I'm trying to do is find a line that passes through the middle of this data set in a certain way. And if I can do that, I can represent each one of these points as the position along this line. So I don't really need two coordinates to represent this point. All I need to know is it's this far out on the line. Okay, so that's like the coordinate with respect to this new axis. Now really I have another axis out here and the other axis doesn't have a lot of variation in it and therefore we can just kind of forget that axis because it's not very interesting. All the action is in this direction. So that's going to be the problem of dimensionality reduction. We're going to come back to that, uh, both of those problems, clustering and, and dimensionality reduction in chapter 10. So uh, that's my introduction to the the class. This is basically what's in chapter two of, of, our, of our textbook. Uh, I'm really looking forward to having you in this class and hope you um, come to love machine learning as much as I do.